And I thought when I became an abstract painter, I needed to get rid of any trace of my previous style of painting. And because I'm an abstract painter now, I need new, new shapes, you know, and, and I, that kept popping up. It just will not go away. And finally I had taken a, a, a long course, a 12 week course uh, during the pandemic. And it really changed my whole philosophy and the way I thought about art and the way I approached art and really got me on a good art practice path. And I realized that shape is me and it's going to be there in, in some way or not. It, it, I, I shouldn't have to get rid of it just to be an mm. abstract. Thing. No. And so now I've allowed that. If it shows up, it shows up. If it doesn't, it doesn't. And I'm okay with it. And I just, it's not my go-to every time. You know. Right. I think that it's it, what I love about uh, spiritual artistry is it's about being self-aware, right? The yeah. fact that you notice that that's part of you, and now you're at cho you're at choice. So once mm -hmm. when you finally start noticing who you are, you enter the realm of I'm at choice. I'm at yeah. choice to use this or not. Good day, listeners. This is the Spiritual Artist Podcast with C.J. Miller, your host, and I am exhausted this morning it was a busy week but i am really excited maybe maybe even more excited than normal excited um because of today's guest um as some of you know i have a retreat every uh i'm starting to do them every six months and i had a retreat in the fall and crystal was one of the uh attendees of the retreat and i've known crystal um I'll safely say from a distance for, mm -hmm. for several years, but this, this was such a wonderful opportunity to spend quality time with her and see her at work and talk to her about ideas and spirituality. And, and it was such a great retreat for everybody that was there, but I'm very excited to introduce Crystal Nelson. Good morning, Crystal. Good morning. How are you? How are you today? <laughs> I was exhausted. <laughs> Everybody's exhausted. So <laughs> I, I will let me tell them a little bit about you. Um, Crystal Nelson is a mixed media artist based in the DFW area. She studied printmaking and painting at the University of Texas, El Paso. And she's recently retired from teaching art for more than 25 years. Um, I think this is wonderful, Crystal. I'm going to take a segue here and come back to talking about you. But um, it's interesting, isn't it? How many teachers came to the retreat? I mean, there was. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, I, I was kind of shocked by that too. I know, and I actually, um, I don't know if you know this, a couple of the people that are signed up for the April retreat, a couple of them are teachers. I just talked to a woman yesterday from Ohio and she's going to come to the retreat and she is a retired teacher. It's interesting that that energy is coming. Nice. But it was yeah. nice, it was so great having you there because um, of what you taught them. So let me tell you a little bit more. Let me tell them a little bit more. Um, Crystal has created art as long as she can remember, but for the last four to five years, she's focused on process-driven abstract art. And we're gonna, we're gonna unpack that word process, Crystal. She loves exploring new textures, shape and color and finding the story within her surfaces. And she's very good at that. Very good with the texture and tactile and, and what I call depth to, to your work. So um, she teaches mixed media and jelly printing workshops and recently curated the deconstructed exhibit for the Visual Art League of Louisville at the Louisville Grand Theater. Crystal's motto is seek beauty, seek truth, and, and we might unpack that too. So anyway, so um, tell me, what do you mean when you say process-driven abstract art? Well, um, for a long time, um, I painted recognizable subject matter. And I'm not going to say I painted realistically, uh, but I did paint representationally. And so when I, and I have always loved abstract art and I, um, you know, you, you only know what you know. So I went to school and learned the different processes from school, oil painting, watercolor, some acrylic. And you, they don't really tell you how to go forth and be an artist after that. You just kind of have to find your way. So I was just doing what they taught me, which is what we probably all do. And um, wasn't really satisfied with that. I really loved abstract art. I loved looking at it and I knew I didn't know how to approach it. So I started taking workshops uh, uh, with different um, techniques and really trying to find some new techniques that might lend itself towards abstract art. 
And uh, just being a printmaker, I really like process uh, more than subject matter. I really like just the aha, you're doing and doing and doing. You're like, oh, wow, look at that. That just developed. That's amazing. That's exciting to me. So for me, uh, I, I approach a painting in that way. I just play and play and play and oh, look what happened and look what happened there and then obliterate and play some more until, like I said, the story kind of reveals itself. I don't impose a story or a subject matter. I kind of let the process help me with that. Yeah, I think I was telling you the other day, um, when we talk about letting a painting tell the story, I, I, I bought... Uh, I got this frame. It's an old fashioned frame that was given to me. It's mm -hmm. probably was like a $5,000, very ornate frame. And I decided I wanted to paint one of my styles on it. And I started painting and the painting doesn't want to be that style. <laughs> <laughs> you know how you, and I don't know how you deal with that when you're working on a painting and you're, you're you maybe you, you know, it's, it's wonderful to let it unfurl. Right. But mm -hmm. what happens when it's unfurling, against what you were your you, you know your need or your expectation how do you handle that uh, a couple of ways i try to work uh some people say in a series sometimes i work in a series but i at least try to work on more than one painting at a time so that when i do get a little stuck and go this is going nowhere or where it's going i don't relate to this or it's not me or i don't know i i can work on another piece for a while and it'll inform that piece. A lot of times I'll go, oh, yeah. I should try this on that piece over there that I'm getting stuck on. And sometimes I just have to walk away and just yeah. put it away and come back with fresh eyes. And that sometimes uh, bites me because uh, in the rear, because I will forget what color scheme I used, what I was doing to begin with if I don't make any notes. And so sometimes I come back and I'm just obliterating that entirely and starting again. You know, and just going, that is not the painting. It's never going to be that painting. It's going to be a different painting. So there's two different ways I kind of. You know, it's funny. I, I called my friend, the guy that's giving me the frame, and I told him my quandary. I said, I want it to be this style of my work, but it's wanting to be this style. And he goes, he goes, for gosh sakes, you're the spiritual artist. You need to let it be what it wants to be. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> you know, but I, I like what you said informs the next um one of the reasons i share that with you i like to do diptychs because mm -hmm. i'll throw th the same colors on two different canvases and it's amazing how so something will work on the one and i i go oh maybe i should take that texture like you're working with over to the other one have you ever done do you have i don't know if i've seen you do any of those i have um i um like to start my work with collage because texture is really really where my love is right now. I mean, that could change. We evolve. But uh, so I, I collage two or three, four or five panels with the same types of papers all at one time. And then oftentimes I'll paint on those with the same color scheme. I'll just use maybe two colors and black and white and, and mix and mix and just kind of let myself go in that direction. And then uh, sometimes they kind of stay, like I said, as a series and they feel like a series. And sometimes they don't because not all of them want to go that way. So, so I have worked that way. Uh, sometimes when you're in an exhibit or a show, uh, you don't have the chance to show that, you know, you may be entering one or one of those five or one of those three. So no one, people don't always get to see that, oh, that was a set of work, a set of thinking, you know, working out the color, the shape, the textures, that's kind of how I, I see it when I'm doing a series like that. I'm working through on all of them. I'm working it out. Sometimes one painting's not enough to do that. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it's fun to try working. I would share that with the listeners. Try that. Try doing three paintings at the same time. Even if you and funny, even if you start them the same way. Yeah. Um, so one of the reasons I, I, I one of the things I want to share with the listeners and why I wanted you on the show so much is um, uh, I, I read that in your bio, but you recently curated the deconstructed exhibit at the Visual Arts League, and and I was lucky enough you had me as a, a, a juror on that, and mm -hmm. um, but I loved we had an artist talk and I want to share this with the listeners. It's a great idea, and if you have a gallery or if you're part of a gallery somewhere in the country, this is a great idea where you invite the artists to come in and on a, on, not on the opening, 
because there's too much going on on the opening night. But maybe a week or two later, you have people come in and they stand in front of their art and they explain it and share it. Um, and so you were explaining your art and and you were talking about how you come up with shapes and how you start your collage. And so I wanted to include this in this podcast because it was I, I was like, oh my gosh, this is great. I want to pull my camera out <laughs> and just record you talking. Um, so listeners, one of the activities on the retreat is learning composition. And, and Crystal, a composition to me starts a lot with shape. So I wanted to tell the listeners, how do you, how do you come up with your shapes? And, and uh... Well, um, I kind of have a, what I like to call a, a visual vocabulary and, and shapes that I tend to go back to. If, if anyone out there listening is an abstract artist or dealing with a lot of shapes, you find yourself repeating those similar shapes, like the paintings behind me, you'll see a vessel or a vase and, and that seems to repeat itself. But sometimes when you're, uh, let me move the other way, sorry. <laughs> I always yeah. forget what you're going. But yeah, you'll see kind of bowls, vessels, and those kinds of shapes. They tend to pop up a lot. But you know, sometimes you're like, well, I need a new shape. And, and there are no more shapes because you get stuck in your rut of shapes. And you think, I guess there are squares and circles, but I, that's not me. You know, I need some new shapes. So I kind of came up with a, it was an accident at first, how I came across it. I happened to have a, uh, a shoe problem. I will just admit it here on the podcast. I, <laughs> I have a lot of shoes, which in turn means I have a lot of shoe boxes. And so I will break my boxes down to put them in recycling. And I'm going to show you an example. Uh, and as I was breaking them down, I was finding, um, just shapes within the box as I broke it. I didn't cut this shape. It's just a shape. This is not a shape, especially this edge up here is not an edge I would have drawn or used. I wouldn't have thought of that on my own. So I started looking at kind of all the packaging that I was breaking down for recycling and pulling it apart, like even at the edges, like just cutting it along the natural fold of the box, which obviously this side is nothing new, right. but this side, you know, I, I, I'll share that with the listeners. If you're listening to this uh, as as a podcast, this is one of those times you might want to go to YouTube and oh. see the visual. But oh, Crystal yeah. is holding up this beautiful box that she opened up. It has a gorgeous um, pattern on the inside, as well as the shape, right? The fold, the odd shape of the box opened and extended. The weird angles, right? Yes, yes. Different angles that I wouldn't have thought because I think we go to the go-to kind of, you know, geometric shapes because – we're just, we just do, unless we force ourselves not to. And so, I mean, even like, this is just a Dr. Pepper box. And it, when I pulled it apart at the end, I got, I get this kind of interesting shape, but again, I wouldn't have probably, and then I start cutting those apart different ways, but it gives me a jumping point for stuff. And another, another one, which I think is interesting. I didn't talk about this at the, um, at the talk at the gallery, but um, let me find it. I do have it. Uh, stencils, letter stencils to be specific. Mm -hmm. um, I like lettering, but if you cut the lettering in, in half, you can probably tell. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. That's, I, I would see it's funny. I would never, I've thing. never thought of that taking a traditional stencil, but cutting it so that you're breaking oh, the line. Right, right. And so this is the X, Y, Z part of that. Then I think of the V and the W up here at the top, if you really think about it. But when I turn that on its side or even chop this in half, that's a whole nother situation. And uh, things I wouldn't have thought of before at all. I mean, I think about a letter as a shape. I really like that idea, but the negative space around the letter, especially in stencil form, is something that really um, can create a, Something That's branded. a great I that is such a great idea, Crystal. I mean, that is such a great idea uh, uh, of um, you know, I usually teach that you sit there and you paint until a shape arrives. But I love this, I know, and sometimes people get frustrated, right? Because nothing arrives, or at least they don't feel it arrives, but you're giving yeah. them a jump, a jumping point. Right. And the way I like to use those is I uh in either of those, the ones with the boxes or the letters, I'll just trace many ways you can trace. You can trace them with a like a water soluble uh crayon or or uh, graphite where you can wash it off if you don't like it 
uh, or, or knock it back. Um, sometimes I use an actual paint pen um, and sometimes I just use the paint and maybe use it more like a stencil. But if I'm tracing it on there, I like to trace them layered on top of each other because once you then start to turn them perpendicular to themselves or to each other and trace, 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 when you're overlapping, you have even more shapes. Yeah, that yeah, you, that's you, that you, in between. Yeah, the opaqueness. Yeah. The mm -hmm. and then you can paint away what you don't want, or or paint what you want to emphasize. You just kind of go the negative or the positive or both, and it just gives you a springboard, I think, for just more interesting shapes that you might not have thought about on your own. Well, um, do you also um, use colored tissue paper and stuff? Do you I actually do. cut? Yeah. I do. I, I paint my own tissue paper um, with a mixture of uh, watered down gel medium and like a, a, a golden fluid paint. So where it's a wash, a very thin wash, but I have that gel medium in there so that when I paint it on the tissue paper, I paint the huge piece of tissue paper solidly with that color or I mix them however I want to do it. Let that dry and that tissue paper then becomes plastic because gel medium is acrylic and acrylic is a polymer you know it is plastic so that tissue paper becomes really tough and uh it collages really well with acrylic medium and and blends well with acrylic paint because it is made of the same thing now that i've saturated it with the gel medium and the golden paint or whatever okay. paint. you have to explain that again so you take because are you talking about like the tissue paper that you'd buy like to wrap a birthday gift with just white tissue paper i use spectrum tissue paper spectra and it is a uh if you get it in the colors i i learned this from teaching middle schoolers if you get it in the colors spectra tissue paper is a bleeding tissue paper right so if you wet it one color will bleed into another and that's great for collage too because you can mix colors just by allowing those two colors of tissue to bleed together well this i just use the white or you know just the plain white spectra tissue paper and then paint it, stain it is, is how I learned it to be called staining it. I stain it with just a thin down acrylic paint using gel medium and distilled water. And I just- Doesn't it, it crinkle up? Doesn't it like yes, crinkle? It, it gives you a little bit of a texture. Yeah, it does crinkle up a little bit. You can do techniques on it. You can lay, uh, you can put that wet wash on there and much like uh, watercolor paint, you can lay a piece of saran wrap on top of that. And that saran wrap will cause the paint to puddle and pool in areas like it does it with and so then you have a piece of tissue and the great thing about that is if you're using if you're thinning down your paint well enough or you're using an already translucent paint which it'll tell you you know on the bottle or on the tube how transparent yeah. it is mm -hmm. if you're using a transparent paint uh and the tissue paper is also transparent uh, especially when you put that gel medium on there it it makes it even more translucent, I should say. So when you collage that, you can still see the shapes coming through from the underneath side. So right. it's, it, it's great to give depth because it does give you a shape, however you cut it out, but it also gives you depth because you can see through it almost like a wash. So you, take, so you take a white tissue paper and you pick a color that you like. You also mm -hmm. might take a stencil that you found or created. And you I cut. Could. Now you don't cut it out first. First you paint it. I do just big sheets of it and I just lay it on trash bags on the floor. <laughs> I love this. Just paint it all the way across and fill my whole entire floor. The studio floor is just filled with cheap trash bags opened up flat with these wet. So I had to let them dry overnight. And the next day I come in, they peel off the trash bag perfectly because it's plastic and it just peels right off. And then I just have a huge stack of it and I chop it up in whatever shapes I might want to. Oh, I think it's, that's fantastic. We're gonna have to do that. We're gonna have to do that on the retreat. Just that, <clears throat> I love that. Well, you know, it's so funny how, I think the more you learn about art, you realize that everybody has a different way of doing it. And yet we often get similar results, but I, I have used, <clears throat> you know, I'm a big brayer fan. I love using a brayer, but mm -hmm. I have taken a trash bag. I put texture on a canvas and I'll take a trash bag and roll over it to get mm -hmm. what you're calling you know, those crinkles and that translucency. Wow. And right. if, I, if I use a translucent paint, likewise, you'll get colors bleeding through. And oftentimes you'll find a new color that you decide, hey, I like that color and I want to play that color up, right, in other parts right. of the painting. Right. But the way you do it is it's just I never thought of this. I never thought of, you know, sitting down and make, making shapes first. 
Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's kind of fun. And another, okay. Can I say one more way? Yeah. Oh, of course. <laughs> I think I, I love this is full of so much information. <laughs> another way I like to do it is just taking a, a cheap piece of drawing paper, just like, you know, a sulfite drawing paper, real cheap, uh, however big you want. And I paint it with uh, house paint. That's just from a sample of house paint, you know, like. Which by the way, is a great way to get, yeah, go into the paint stores and get their samples. Yeah. And, and, or the, or the, um, paint that people bring back and they say, I don't want yeah. the paint. It's color. down. Yeah. You get those and it's latex. So it's also a plasticky surface and you paint a couple layers on there. And then so I have a couple of colors here, which depending on what color schemes and you can tell like they stuck together and right pull that's but that's okay though. that makes it interesting yeah. right that okay. that deckled rip look makes it more interesting right and then i take my ideas for shapes and then i just cut them out <laughs> and so this is like that negative part right that, which truly oh for this shape and then went oh well that's kind of a little vessel shape I, this kind of looks like an, a letter i guess it could be an h but depending on how i turn it or i could further cut it and then when I glue these, I don't use these to trace. These are, I use these to paint. I like to paint with cut papers because I can lay them on the canvas and move them around and I'm not committed to anything. It's a color. I can decide, oh, I want a blue on my canvas. I can lay this on there and go, oh, that's not the right blue. Well, I haven't painted it. So it's not permanent. It's not on there. I don't have to worry about, oh no, I painted it. I need to wipe it off or cover over it or whatever. I can just move this around until I go, oh, I think that works pretty good right there and glue it down or paint that shape. Because now I've seen it in color and it can become a permanent part, a collage part of the painting or it can become, I could trace them. But usually when I use them pre-painted like this, they are seen in the painting. You know, um, I do that. I do that one, but like near the end of a painting, when I feel like there's something wrong, I'll take my palette and cut it up. Like I'll see, like a piece of black, and I'll I'll move it around and go. It needs something. Th th this is too solid, right? Or so, mm -hmm. and I'll move that shape around. But then I paint it in. You know, I, I don't, I don't, I don't literally paint it in. I paint it in. But I love that that. Um, I told you this at the show, and and I hope you send me some images of your work, and we'll slide them over the screen. But you have such wonderful story in your work. Um, you can see those layers, and 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 you want to touch it, right? You see, you, I, Crystal, I see one of your paintings. I want to touch it because it has depth, such depth. And I think the, the ways, all these different ways, and it's not like you're just doing one. It's not like you're just doing cutting layer cutting shapes and putting it on or cutting tissue or painting it on, or you're doing it like mixing it up. Right. I do try to do it all right. Because you know, you, uh, like a piece like this is, is opaque, the painted paper that's opaque. And that's just going to stop you right there. But the painted tissue, and I wish I would have brought that over here. I did not. It's translucent. Mm -hmm. It's translucent. So it pulls it, it get, and you can go over something that's, that's opaque like that and still be able to see it a little bit, but it gives you one more layer. And with collage, I think because people think about it being your gluing pieces of paper, I think people think about it being just solid layer on top of solid layer on top of solid layer. And then you lose whatever's underneath and you really, you really don't depending on the types of paper. You right. Use. And you it don't want to fun. lose. Oftentimes you don't want to lose. What's, I think the biggest lesson for me was I, I, you know, when we have a controlling personality, I would paint these solid areas in, and there are times to do that. But mm -hmm. oftentimes sure. I've, I've learned now to let it be messy. Let some areas mm -hmm. come through, even if it's an old, old piece of color, like three layers down, it adds such story to the final work. Yeah, it does. And, and someone walks up and they go, what, what's this bright orange coming through here in an otherwise monochromatic painting? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's how you can do, that's how you can do black and white paintings or monochromatic paintings and make them exciting is to have that color way underneath. Right, right. Definitely. I really encourage people if they uh, like uh, take a mixed media class with me is not to get married to or uh, to an uh, overly enamored with, with that first layer. Yeah, because we're playing and having fun and laying stuff down, and it's beautiful. And I am guilty of it. Oh my gosh, look at this! And you know, it's ooh, but 
it's never happening there. Just take the risk, paint right over that or collage right over that. And that will, if it doesn't show through like you're talking about where an orange is peeking through the monochromatic black and white, then it's going to show through texture wise. It's right. still going to develop history there. And that's what I'm kind of talking about the story. I'm not generally imposing a story on my painting. I'm not coming to it with like, oh, I want to tell this beginning, middle and end kind of narrative story. But just as the texture and the layers are being built up, I see a story there that I sometimes can explain and sometimes can't. But I'm hoping the viewer can look at it and go into it with some, you know, see into that painting and see some kind of history or story, whether it be, whether it's representational or emotional or spiritual. You, you, yeah, I think what makes a painting interesting is when someone walks past it and they've had it hanging in their house for three months and they suddenly go, oh, what's that? They, you know, they notice these little things. Um, you just said it, so many things that I, I would like to grab on to. Um, one of the things you said is, I agree. The, 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 the biggest wall to a successful painting is a good first coat. <laughs> you know, when you do that first level and suddenly and you're like, whoa, it freezes you. <clears throat> and, you know, I'm going to use this as an opportunity for a spiritual principle that I've learned to align this with. And I've taught this to other people. Sometimes when we can get so happy with when something is good <laughs> that we limit our great. Does it, that, does that make sense? Yeah. It's like, oh, this is so good. And we stop and that we can do that in life. We can have, uh, we can be working on something or have a job. That's, this is a good job. It's a good job. It pays me well, but you yeah. know, the spiritual principle is, but you can reach to even great. You don't, you know, it's some, and sometimes you have to let go of something that's good. Right. Right. You do. I think that risk is what, where you get the great from some of my best paintings, some of the paintings I've sold and been shocked about it were old, were a whole different painting underneath that just did not, just didn't have it. It didn't work somehow. And, or, and I liked pieces. And this is another thing I think we do. You're like, Ooh, this is a great little area right here. And we paint, or we continue mm -hmm. the next layer, but we paint around it. And then it, it's not great anymore because it isn't relating to its original place, original layer. It's now relating to this new layer. It's not nearly as great. We've tried to isolate it because we thought this is fabulous. Like, everybody needs to see this. It's so important. But if we just take the risk and kind of go into it or over it or even veil it with a glaze or something, it becomes so much better. I find that risk makes it better. Just yeah, and you know what's funny? And it's not a it's it's not cut and dry. It's a dance mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. sometimes you can leave a little piece there. And you it can. does work, right? Suddenly it works even better. And so right. I think it's that we talked about this on the retreat. You talk about it with your shapes. It's a dance. You add, you subtract, you add, you subtract. Yes. You have to just be willing to engage in that dance and not and just be married, take right a risk, away. take mm -hmm. a risk, right? It's like yeah. you said, you know, it's funny that you said that I was going to share a story with our listeners. I, I um, years ago um, when I painted from anger, and I, I do think art is a wonderful therapy tool. I painted this painting and I painted swear words into it, you know? Mm -hmm. So I had the F word written in there real big, you know? And then I kept painting like you talk about. Well, sure enough, I came back to it a month later and I painted over it. Beautiful mm -hmm. painting. It's just a little bit of that K still in there. <laughs> and <laughs> <laughs> and someone bought it. And I just thought it was so funny to see this painting go out into the world and see just this K, just this little K that like, but underneath it was that, that expression of emotion. And it's very real, right? Sure. We all feel that way sometimes. And yet a piece of it was still in there and it yeah. worked. It did work. Yeah. It wasn't obviously a K, you know, it's not like, in fact, I don't know if anybody would have noticed it, but me. Right, like, right. But, you know, I'm positive that's why they bought that, because you left that authenticity in there when you were rage painting. Yeah. <laughs> you, oh, that's I love that word. Rage painting. Yeah. Rage painting. And then you you came back and, and refined it or whatever. You know, you felt differently probably when you came back to it. And so you did whatever you did. They felt that. They felt that authenticity in there. I know that's a heavily used word these days, but they felt the real you. They may not have known there was anger under that, but you left the real you there. and continued on with some more you right <laughs> some, more some more shades of you yeah yeah so one of the things i wanted to share too uh, ideas 
uh, I would love our listeners, uh, if you're on YouTube, to write your ideas for, for finding texture and shape. But one of the things you haven't talked about, and I don't know if you use it a lot, do you ever use newsprint or magazines or anything like that? Do you ever collage that in? Newsprint, as in a blank newsprint or newsprint? Or like an old newspaper, an old newspaper or, or old page from a book. Do you ever do that or do you not? I do. Uh, uh, magazine is a little weird for me just because of the slick surface. I like a more porous surface, so I would be more apt to use. I use a lot of old books with just the text on the page that is a newsprint type of paper. I like that it's absorbent and it has an age look to it. Um, right. Often I use that for my underlayers. Um, and, and there are times when I do more uh, solidly collage work and then I do pick beautiful papers or things that I can find in, in old, you know, like some ephemera, older papers that I want to show through that, and there's not a lot of paint involved. I kind of work more than one way. I, it's usually always mixed media, but I usually call it mixed media collage. If there's more collage, less paint. And then say that, okay, say, say that again. I call it a mixed media collage if it's uh -huh. heavier on collage and collage is really holding the weight of the composition. And there might be a few little marks of paint in there, which then makes it a mixed media collage in my mind. Uh -huh. But it's a mixed media painting. If the collage isn't evident, the paint is more evident. The paint is carrying the load of the composition. Then that's kind of why, because it's all mixed media work, but I tend to say painting if paint is carrying the load. And I tend to say mixed media collage if collage is carrying the load. So oh, that's when, when the collage, you'll see more of that type of paper showing through and understand, it. oh, look, and, and I'm using it for a compositional reason. Hmm, that's an interesting way of looking at it. Yeah. Um, what I want to share with our listeners that you were talking to me the other day about transfers. And can you explain to them just briefly, I don't expect you to do a demo, but how how a tra how is a transfer different from what you're doing here with, with these pieces of paper? Or is it um, not? Transferring kind of uh, pulls me back into my printmaking past, which I really love to print from anything. Uh, I even love to just paint on a piece of paper and then smack it on the painting and pull it off and whatever paint is left, that's a print. So I like transferring something from one surface to another surface because it's not the same as just painting that mark on the painting. So a transfer is uh, you can use a laser copy or you can use a magazine depending on the type of ink the magazine was printed with, it needs to be uh, very saturated, like a um, National Geographic type magazine has really good ink laid on that, that surface. And the way I transfer, your listeners will probably know a hundred other ways to transfer. I sometimes do it through a jelly print, but the way we talked about is I lay down a gloss medium. I usually use gloss. I don't think you have to, but I tend to. Okay. A heavy coat of gloss medium and I take the magazine or the laser print and put it face down into that gloss medium on the canvas or the board that I'm working on and then I burnish it really really well with my finger or a, a baron or back of a spoon works beautifully I burnish it really well so all of that surface is really smushed into that gel medium and then I let it dry and that's the hardest thing about transfers people keep wanting to pull it up early or look at it early, you just let it dry. And the paper that if I'm using a laser print is printed on copy paper. So that kind of gets a little transparent from the gel medium and you can kind of see through it a little bit. Once it's fully dry, magazine or copy, I then wet it with a spray bottle and let that soak for just a second or two. And you'll see the paper start to get very translucent. And then I use my finger and just rub off that paper and it leaves behind the image, oh. whether it's from the ink, it can be in color, it can be a color magazine, and it just leaves behind that image, which often is very translucent as well. So you can do it right on top of your pre-existing collage or pre-existing paint, and it just leaves that image. Sometimes it leaves a really ghost type image. Sometimes it leaves a really solid image. Um, if people are gonna experiment with it, I would experiment before you go put it on something precious, but um, it doesn't always work perfectly. You have to be okay with that. You have to be okay with it being sometimes partial or sometimes cloudy or sometimes you have to be okay with that. You can always paint. 
<laughs> that's a step yeah. right there, right? Yes, you have to be okay with that. It, it's the same with, you just have to let that go and go, let's see what I get. So it's, I would say, uh, experiment before you mm -hmm. go and put it on like you're, ooh, I'm gonna put this picture of this tractor, tra you know, image transferred onto this beautiful painting that I already love. Uh, don't, don't do that <laughs> until you kind well, of once again. more familiar. Now, you know, we talked about, I want to talk, address this too, because I love the way you look for shapes. <clears throat> and I always talk about people having what's called creative DNA. And you mentioned, and we can see it in, in the background in the picture, you know, this tendency to go to um, urns or bottle-like shapes. There's a bottle-like shape that you like. And I did notice that one of the pieces you held up from the box that you were attracted to also had kind of a bottle-like shape. Yeah, that is true. Let's see. Do you see it there? Do you see it? I know. Well, I just feel like our creative DNA is also in what we're attracted. It's not in just what we create, but it's what we're attracted to, right? Right. And I tried to fight that. You know, I tried to, uh, when I started uh, doing abstract painting, as you well know, um, I don't know if you've ever done more <clears throat> representational painting prior to being an abstract artist, but when I started doing abstract art, I never came into it thinking it was easy. I knew it wasn't going to be easy, but it has been so much harder than I thought it was ever going to be. Uh, and I thought I was going to need to get rid of, because before doing this type of painting, I painted a lot of florals, also in bowls and in vases and in cups. Oh, always, yeah. That vessel has always been with me since college. That vessel has been there um, or some iteration of it. Um, and I thought when I became an abstract painter, I needed to get rid of any trace of my previous style of painting. And because I'm an abstract painter now, I need new, new shapes, you know, and, and I, that kept popping up. It just will not go away. And finally I had taken a, a, a long course, a 12 week course uh, during the pandemic. And it really changed my whole philosophy and the way I thought about art and the way I approached art and really got me on a good art practice path. And I realized that shape is me and it's going to be there in, in some way or not. It, it, I, I shouldn't have to get rid of it just to be an mm. abstract. Thing. And no. so now I've allowed that. If it shows up, it shows up. If it doesn't, it doesn't. And I'm okay with it. And I just, it's not my go-to every time, you know? Right. I think that it's it, what I love about uh, spiritual artistry is it's about being self-aware, right? The fact that you've noticed that that's part of you, and now you're at cho you're at choice. So once when you finally start noticing who you are, you enter the realm of I'm at choice. I'm at right. choice to use this or not. Right. I like that at choice. That's yeah, a nice place to be. It is. If you're not aware of it, if you're not self-aware, that's why I try to get uh, as part of my activities is I have people write down what tools do you use? Who are you right now? And mm -hmm. and that the good practice for listeners is if you put a piece of paper up on the wall and write on the top, my toolbox. And when you mm -hmm. like Crystal, when you notice something like, oh, I'm, I gravitate towards these shapes, write it down just mm -hmm. so that you remember it. That doesn't mean you have to, like, you're right, Crystal. No, you shouldn't avoid it. You should not but you can avoid it if you want. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just didn't know. I, I just thought in my head, of course, when we when we grew up, um, uh, abstract expressionism was probably something that influenced us a lot because that was in that was happening as we were coming into the world. And that's often how what you're inspired by, like mid-century modern is a very yeah. inspirational thing to you and to me both. But yeah. it, it also occurred just as we were coming into the world. So there's something about us growing up, probably in a home that reflected that, um, or grandparents' house reflected that design aesthetic. And we are pulled to that because it was just, I always think, you know, when people are like, oh, I love vintage. And I think vintage is different to everybody. It's, <laughs> I tend to find it, it's just before you entered the earth that, that you long for somehow. It, maybe it's because it was your parents or your grandparents, but a lot of times like, you know, younger people will be like, man, I love the 80s. And usually they're 90s kids, you right. know, or 90s people or they're not kids anymore. Sorry, adults. Y'all are yeah. adults. <laughs> it's, um, and so I don't know if that's totally true. I'm not a scientist, but um, it feels that's one of my truths. So I'm attracted to that 
that design aesthetic, and I forgot where I was going with this, but that keeps popping up in me probably because it was pretty um, ingrained in me as a kid. It's the design I saw. It's the style I am attracted to when I, when I see it out in, in the world or, you know, it's kind of just a, a thing that's, uh, I, I, I can't take it away from myself. So, oh, I know what. So when I started doing um, abstract paintings, I was thinking, oh, I probably need to do like color field because that was also a, a time that was what that was what was happening at the at the time of art that I was really interested in in art history. And I was like, oh, I should do color field paintings, you know, just these really big squares of red with a slightly darker square of red underneath it. <laughs> yeah. Non-objective ab abstract <laughs> paintings. There's many types of abstract paintings, as you know, but I thought, oh, I have to do non-objective. It's only color, texture, and, and very plain shapes. These, these very non-committal shapes, I call them. Like a square is, it has no meaning to me. <laughs> and then I realized that, that, that's not me. That's not how it was working. And that darn vessel kept popping up. So I just, that's when I realized, oh, I can still be me and it can still be abstract. So it's, it's the intent behind it. I'm not intending to set up a representational situation for you. You know, it's yeah, how I'm one, you just said a whole bunch too, that I could, uh, that I love to respond to, but I think when you talk about, we are, we are creatures, we are, uh, What's the word I'm looking at? We are the result of the times that we were born in. Yeah. We are. And that that's that 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 consciousness the of your environment, whether it's the the country that you're in, you know, you talk mm -hmm. about the country and their beliefs, the religion that you're brought up in. And I talked about this in a podcast a couple back um with with an artist, a sense of place. We are. We also we also react to where we're born. Are we born? Were we born in a place where there were wide open fields? Were we born in a place where there were a lot of trees? Were we born in the jungle, the desert? What what sense of place do we have? All those things come together, and once again, it goes back to like you said, it's that self awareness of who we are. Now, <clears throat> when I talked to you about this when I juried the show. Mm -hmm. And I will share this with the listeners. What I looked for when I did the show at the work is I didn't want to see someone just replicating, like you talked about color fields. Mm -hmm. Now, if they took color fields and added their in unique creative DNA, like your bottles or your urn shapes, that's a whole different thing. That's when an artist transcends what they're looking at and, and actually incorporates their own unique creative DNA. That is when something sizzles. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. I agree. I do. You know. We also talked about the sense of place thing. I, again, becoming an abstract artist, I still feel I'm new with this. Um, I look at and appreciate paintings with with nice space in them, open spaces. But that's not you and I talked about that. That's not how my paintings look, obviously. Oh, yeah. <laughs> There's no space. In them. They're, they're edge to edge, wall to wall, back to front, filled. And I have tried, I have tried to push myself into that, oh, I want to have it veiled with all of this white at the top and have this lovely restful place for your eye. And then I realized in my life, in my home, in my decor, in my head, <laughs> it's not still like that. It's busy. I, I have a very, uh, I have a lot of visual stimulation in my home, <laughs> which just means I have a lot of stuff. But I, that's how I operate. I need to see a lot of textures, a lot of things, a lot of shapes. So I live the way I paint. And my brain also works. It's this and it's this and it's this and it's this. And oh, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work on this for a minute and work on this for a minute. It, it's like that. So I can't paint with that space, even though I really appreciate that my sense of space is this. <laughs> it's a little insane. <laughs> it's a little cluttered which I realized again, becoming more self-aware that that's okay. That's true. Yeah, it, it is okay. That's but I, you did use a word that I will, I will, I will put out there. You could, you can't, you, it's not that you can't, you're at choice. We're at choice. And yeah. you could, you could say someday you could get up in the morning and say, you know, I'm going to challenge myself and I'm going to make sure that this painting has a big area right. of nothing right. or soft texture. I think I need to work on that though, because then I would, <laughs> Feel like I'd have to practice that in my life as well. 
and not just, you know, barrel through. I feel like if I can find, like with meditation, find more quiet spaces in my life, I feel like that could be easier for me to impose on my paintings because I'd have it somewhere in my spirit, in myself mm -hmm. somewhere. And then I could, and, and I'd love to, believe me. <laughs> I'm working <laughs> on it. I mean, it's but, <laughs> right. We're never there. It's an art. We're never there. No. We're, it, just practicing that's why i love it so much i think that's why i'm so engaged with art making and self-improvement awareness mindfulness because they are connected you are in your paintings people can see you in there if if you don't think that's the truth it is the truth people can see everything they can see <clears throat> not only they can see what affects you do you where you were born what your beliefs are what your sensibilities are how you orchestrate your mind the and i believe the feeling that you had when you did it Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, they see yeah. all that. Just like you with your angry painting that you were talking about, you left, that was there. It was under there and they probably, they don't, maybe they couldn't articulate it and you probably maybe couldn't either, but that tension was still underneath there. Yeah. It's interesting. It I caused it to be appealing to them. So it yeah. It's very there. interesting, especially the people that have it. So I, I won't share that, but it's very interesting. And, and, but you're right. You can feel it. And so, um, I love this. I loved, I loved listening to you at the, at the show, at the art talk, talking about how you've come up with these shapes. It's inspired me to kind of approach the canvas differently that mm -hmm. I should pull some tissues back in and, and all those things and look at how to find new shapes. Um, I do think, and we talked about this, that shapes are so important to abstract, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I will share this with the listeners. One of the biggest challenges I see out there with people doing abstracts is they think it's just a mushy mush of stuff on the canvas, but there actually is composition and shape and breaking the canvas down into areas mm -hmm. and, and spaces, you know, the painting, um, the, I love that painting. I guess it's your back left, the upper back left. You can see you've divided the canvas and you've broken it down. And there are spaces of, there are shapes that give yeah. it structure. Uh, yeah. The, the teal one, uh, but the other side, Oh, that one, yeah. see how you can see oh, the yeah. line in it and it's yes. broken apart. All your paintings have that though. I, in fact, did you ever do graphic design or anything like that? Uh, I went, uh, when I first went to college, it was commercial art typography uh, and design and I do feel designy or designery. I make up words by the way. <laughs> I feel very design sometimes I feel like I'm designing something too much because I really like it to have a certain feel. And so even just being this loose with what you're seeing behind me is sometimes a struggle because I'm like, ooh, I want to have a little more control over that. I like that graphic feeling of of design. I really do. And and I relate to that and I'm attracted to that because I think it that that a good painting has both. It has mm -hmm. looseness, but some tension. It has it has line, but some blur. It has faded mm -hmm. edges, but you know sharp shapes. I think that's what makes it so engaging. You know. Yeah. So. yeah. Well, this, I am I am thrilled to have you, and I'm excited that you're coming to the retreat in April. Um, uh, listeners, there's a couple slots still open for that April retreat. It's going to be a great group. It's here in Texas. Um, I've also set the dates for a November retreat. It's going to be the second week of November. Um, I think the 14th, it's going to be on a weekend. I've scheduled this one so that it'll actually be a Thursday night, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Um, so, Crystal, is there anything that we didn't talk about you want to share? This is your key moment here. So. My key moment. Um, I don't know. I invite everybody to follow me on Instagram at Christy mm. Nelson. We'll put that maybe in your, your show notes. Yes. Um, I am sad to say I don't have a website, but that's coming soon. It's one of those things that I'm, you know, Every year, something new, right? You just add to your your box of things and, and the way people can find you. Um, I kind of like to leave with a quote, if that's okay. Oh, yeah, I love it. Hanging on my wall. And it is, in creativity, there is getting attention and paying attention. Mm. So there's getting attention and paying attention. And I think there's room for both. And uh, I think as spiritual artists, paying attention is very important to ourselves and, and to our work. And the more we pay attention to our surroundings and to how we're processing and painting or whatever type of work you do, I think the getting attention thing kind of comes on its own. That will happen. I agree. 
I love it. I love that quote. It's wonderful. Um, definitely something for the the listeners to think about. Um, so I, I, I thank you for following the spiritual artist podcast. And I'm going to say something that you, you reminded me of crystal. I don't ever tell people that I am on Instagram as well. You can follow me at CJ Miller art is my hashtag. And I also am, there's a hashtag, the spiritual artist podcast. So one of them focuses more on, like you said, wonderful quotes <laughs> and the other <laughs> is my art itself. You can see some samples of my work. So, um, and also follow this on your player. Make sure you like it, download it on YouTube. Make sure you follow me so you'll get more updates. Uh, Crystal, you know what? This was so good. I'm, I'm probably going to try to have you come back sometime in the future because I, I I love this. I, I was so and excited you know what, to ask me. I was like, oh my goodness, this is so exciting. I know. And you know what? I probably would want to focus on. I'm already going to put it in there. I love mark making. You, you're, mm -hmm. you're, The way you make marks. We'll just put that out there. <laughs> you know, that, and that's a whole nother thing, right? That's a whole yes, nother thing. Different discussion. Yes. All right. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for listening to the Spiritual Artist Podcast, and we will see you soon on the Spiritual Artist Podcast. Talk to you later. Thanks again for listening to the Spiritual Artist Podcast. Whether you're watching this show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, or iHeartRadio, make sure you choose the subscribe button so that you will receive updates when new segments are released. Most importantly, be still, listen, and know that you are a spiritual artist.